Hello, my name is Juliana Tu, and I had the opportunity to attend the first of five forums put together in different locations of the country by the Mortgage Bankers Association, the American Land Title Association, the National Association of Realtors on the TRID, the TILA RESPA Integrated Disclosures. TILA is the Truth in Lending Act and RESPA is the Real Estate Settlements Procedures Act. We have been governed under these two regulations for approximately 50 years. But now change is coming and panels formed of legal counsels from various firms and organizations, industry heads, representatives from the big lenders were there to talk about all the changes that will be happening in their particular field and how we should prepare ourselves. There were also representatives from the CFPB. I was one of the panelists, and at this first forum, I represented the viewpoints of the escrow industry through the California Escrow Association and the American Escrow Association. I came back with my head full of information, which I would like to share with you now. You know the feeling that a day you are really not looking forward to is slowly creeping up and there is nothing you can do to make time stand still? Well, August 1 is that dreaded date, the date that the new integrated disclosures will be put on the table. The whole country's lending industry, and consequently any industry affiliated with the lending industry, should mark this as a red letter day. Here is a little background. The Dodd-Frank Act was enacted in July of 2010 as a response to the economic crash that started in 2007. The act called for the promoting of financial stability and improvement in accountability and transparency of the financial system. It called for the protection of consumers from abusive financial practices. A bunch of government agencies were consolidated, and one agency was established to oversee the protection of consumer interests. This new one agency is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, otherwise known as the CFPB. The CFPB has taken on everything that has to do with consumers and the financial industry, whether it is the big banks, little credit unions, student loans, credit card companies, payday lenders, mortgages, foreclosures, etc. The original draft of the TRID ruling started out at 1,099 pages, and it ended up at 1,888 pages. Because it all has to do with consumers, the rules and regulations that the CFPB has come out with affects a lot of industries. They are an independent agency housed within the Federal Reserve, but they do not need any funds from Congress and do not come under any congressional supervision. Congress, as you can imagine, is not happy. In fact, Recently, the House Financial Services Committee conducted a hearing on the CFPB with Director Richard Cordray in the hot seat. The committee said that, quote, the CFPB undoubtedly remains the single most powerful and least accountable federal agency in all of Washington, end quote. The CFPB is very conscious of complaints from the consumer. You may have heard that back in January of 2015, there was a mortgage kickback investigation against Wells Fargo and J.P. Morgan Chase. They found bank loan officers taking kickbacks through a now defunct title company. For their failure to oversee their employees, Wells was fined $25 million and Chase $11.7 million in penalties and restitution. On February 10, they came down on New Day Financial for using deceptive mortgage advertising and kickbacks, and their fine was a relatively minor $2 million. Then, on February 12th, it was All Financial Services, Flagship Financial Group, and American Preferred Lending. So you can see, the CFPB is on a roll. You know that the CFPB put forward the guidelines for qualified mortgages back in January of 2013. They were also mandated to consolidate the good faith estimate, truth in lending disclosures, and the RESPA settlement forms into one integrated disclosure. 
They chose the date of August 1, and for all loans that are submitted after that date, new regulations come into play, and with that, new forms. Instead of the GFE, the TIL, and the HUD-1 form, we will have the initial loan estimate, the LE, and the final closing disclosures, the CD. These are brand new terms that we will have to learn. I am here to tell you why you need to be concerned. There are five players in this scenario. I call it the Battle of the Five Armies, CFPB style. The consumer, the lending industry, the title industry, the settlement services industry, and the real estate industry. You are probably wondering, why the real estate industry? I will get to that in the highlights that I am sharing with you. First of all, the new terms. Escrow practitioner or escrow officer is going to be called the settlement agent. The lender is the creditor. The day the loan documents are signed and borrower is obligated to the loan is going to be the consummation day. Close of escrow day, otherwise known as the day the transaction is closed, is the settlement day. The LE is the loan estimate. It takes the place of the GFE. And the CD is the closing disclosures, which takes the place of the TIL and the HUD-1. The importance of what I am stating today all comes from issues of timing and responsibility. The rules state that the responsibility for giving the integrated disclosures falls on the lenders, and the rules also has mandatory time periods that the lenders must follow in their delivery of the LE and the CD. The penalties are huge if they don't follow the guidelines. First time around, $5,000 a day for each day they don't correct or fail to pay. If the lender continues to disregard them, $25,000 a day. If the lender knowingly violates this law, $1 million a day. So how does this affect the Realtors? Let's say that you put together a transaction on a purchase of a property and the buyer needs to get a new loan. The buyer submits information to start the loan process when the offer is accepted. The loan officer is obligated under the new rules to deliver the loan estimate within three business days after he receives the application. After receipt of the LE, the buyer needs to send back a notice of intent to proceed before the loan officer is willing to advance to the next step because, mind you, the buyer has 10 days to return this notice of intent to proceed and anything can happen in 10 days. So the appraisal might not be ordered until the intent is firmly received. Let's say the loan is approved and the lender is ready to order docs. They now have to deliver the CD to the buyer. The CD is five pages long and combines the original Truth in Lending Disclosure and the HUD-1 forms. It contains all the final information on the loan program chosen by the buyer, the costs of the loan, and the costs of the transaction. This all-important form needs to be delivered to the buyer for their review at least three business days before the signing of the loan documents is allowed. This means that the lender has to protect the delivery deadline from any mishaps by scheduling the CD to be sent out seven business days before they will allow the loan docs to be signed. You are probably wondering, why an extra four business days? Well, the lenders are using the mailbox rule, which is a three business day period for mail delivery, even if faster methods are used and then they add one more day for the actual review, and then wait three business days. So, seven business days before they will allow loan documents to be signed. You see where I am going with this? I'd like to show you how it looks if you have a transaction that has to close escrow in 30 days, just simply with the timelines that the CFPB is requiring. I am basing the transaction time period on California's escrow processing timeline. For transactions in other states, these time periods may vary as the process itself is different, but not by that much. So here on this calendar that I have, 
Sundays don't count, so I've left that blank. But Saturdays are considered a business day. We're going to start with day one on a Monday. On day one, the real estate purchase contract is accepted and escrow is opened. On day two, the buyer submits the loan application. On day three, the lender mails out the loan estimate and we need three business days. So day one, day two, day three ends on day six of the calendar. On day eight of the calendar, the buyer gets the LE. On day nine, the buyer mails back the intent to proceed. And on day 10, the lender receives the intent to proceed. On day 11, the lender starts the loan processing and let's give it two weeks. Following the calendar, the two weeks will end on day 25 of the calendar. And on that day, the loan is approved and the lender mails the CD. Remember, three business days. So we have day one, day two, day three. Day three business day ends on day 29 of the calendar. Day 30, the buyer receives the CD and now he has three business days to review. Day one, day two, day three. The buyer can now sign the loan docs on day 34 of that calendar. On day 36, the loan docs are returned to the lender for review. On day 37, the lender funds the loan. And on day 38, the escrow closes. So what is the number of days that we have now in this transaction? 38 days minimum, with everything done immediately, no hiccups, no changes to the loan program. Well, we all know that life and loan qualifications do not happen this way. Given this sample, the time contingency periods on California's new Residential Purchase Agreement, the RPA, 17 days for appraisal, 21 days for loan contingencies, even the 21 days for physical inspection and a preferred 30-day closing may not work well. I want to mention also that most of the big lenders have made the decision to deliver the LE and CD to the buyer borrowers directly. But what the smaller lenders and mortgage bankers will do remains to be seen. Hopefully, if they demand that the settlement agents do the delivery of the CD, we hope that those settlement agents will push back the responsibility back to the lenders. On the seller side, however, it will be the escrow officer's responsibility to issue the CD to the seller on or before the day the buyer signs the loan. Here are some other issues. What if something changes to the loan? There are three types of changes that will automatically require redisclosure and the three business day will start all over again. APR changes by a certain amount, the loan product changes, or there is an addition of a prepayment penalty. Now, other changes may not require the restart of the three business days, but they will require a new CD to be issued before loan documents are signed. So it is important that our clients know that every time they change their minds or the figures change substantially, the closing may be delayed. The lender's goal is to obtain the best information available at the beginning and keep the figures the same throughout the transaction from the issuance of the LE to issuance of the final CD and through to the settlement closing date. This means that the escrow officer needs to keep the figures as close as they can get right at the beginning of the escrow. You all know that some clients see the estimate closing statement when they come in to sign loan docs, and then they question the escrow charges and ask for discounts. Well, after August 1, this is going to be a problem. The lender wants the fees set from the very beginning, especially escrow, title, and notary fees, because these are fees that the lender feels the escrow and title can control. So they are looking at us to get it correct at the beginning. Redisclosure has to be done if the costs change and exceed the 10% change tolerance. The lender will not be happy if we ask them to reissue the CD again and again. 
The concept of no changes also mean that before the final CD is issued and sent to the buyer, all the credits that the buyer negotiated have to be disclosed to the lender. Since a lot of times the credits are negotiated at the walkthrough, it is possible that the walkthrough should probably be done even before the seven business days needed for delivery of the CD. Now you can see how important it is that the real estate agent is fully aware of the TRID regulations. The lender will not allow for cushions or pads. The only changes that they will allow between signing of loan documents and actual closing without having to redisclose will be the change in interest to be paid, proration, and recording fees. And even then, those changes have to be reflected on a new CD to be issued after closing. To protect the customer's non-public personal information, NPPI, well, here's another acronym for everyone to learn, the big lenders are going to ask that we provide the closing figures through an integrated platform that connects their loan software to our escrow software. No more providing figures through emails, fax, or other delivery methods that can be hacked or intercepted. What this means is that once we enter the figures on our side, the figures will migrate directly to the lender. All of our escrow software companies have been working for the last two years at changing and upgrading our software and also getting this interconnectivity done for these major lenders. How it will work for the smaller lenders, we don't know yet. What happens to the HUD-1? It will be gone. Except for refis that involve a HELOC, a reverse mortgage, mobile home loans, or loans that were started before August 1, because these loans will not be affected by the TRID. After August 1, don't ask the escrow officer for a HUD-1. We won't be issuing that government form anymore. It will be the closing statement, which is the form that all our clients like to see anyway. It's a list with all the fees broken down and a debit and credit column on the side. At this time, our clients get to choose who they want to use as escrow and title. One unintended consequence of this whole TRID regulation is that these lenders, because they need to control the fees and costs, will then want to control who will handle their transactions. Some have already made the announcement that they will approach the big title and settlement service escrow companies and work out a deal with them for bundled services, meaning a set one lump sum for all escrow fees, title policies, notary fees, and document fees. This way, they feel, they won't have to worry about any changes in the closing costs because they already know what they will be and they will be set. What this means is that the real estate agent and his client may no longer be able to choose these services. It also means that many small escrow companies and in-house broker-owned escrows may not survive the change. Vetting is another new buzzword. What is vetting? This is a process by which you check out a person's background to make sure that there is nothing in the background that would give rise to questions or issues about the performance in a certain job. The settlement services escrow industry has been fighting against the vetting of escrow companies. Some lenders are demanding that in order to allow an escrow company to handle their transaction, the escrow company has to submit all their company information, including policies and procedure manuals, bank accounts, and even financials to this bank. Not only that, these lending institutions are demanding that escrow staff submit their personal information, social security, driver's license, home addresses, to an unregulated third-party company so that this company can do a yearly credit check on whether or not the person is allowed to handle your escrow paperwork and funds. If the escrow company refuses to hand over this private information, then the lender tells them that they have to transfer the file to a company who has been vetted by them or is exempt from vetting. It does not matter if the transaction is ready to close. It does not matter that the buyer or seller chose the escrow company. 
the bank simply refuses to allow the transaction to go forward. In January, HSBC Bank sent out their vetting requirement and the settlement services industry in California banded together to demand that HSBC stop asking for such vetting. HSBC backed down temporarily. But in those two weeks that this turmoil was going on, some escrow companies lost million dollar transactions because they refused to submit their staff's private information. The fight is still continuing with other lenders. I mentioned before that the CFPB is complaint driven. That means that they are mandated to read every single complaint that is logged into their system and all the complaints are made public. It's called transparency. They have launched a consumer complaint database, which is a public collection of all the complaints that they have received. What the CFPB does is that they will research the complaint and investigate it if they believe it is serious or shows a pattern of negligence against the consumer. Yes, this makes the lenders very nervous, especially since they don't know if these are valid complaints and the process does not give the lenders the opportunity to respond. In fact, the Mortgage Bankers Association has come out strongly against the establishment of this database. They don't want consumers to file complaints because it will bring the CFPB down on them. Remember those penalties. They would rather know about it in advance and resolve it quietly and to the satisfaction of their clients. So the complaint is the biggest tool that the consumer has. A word of caution to my fellow settlement agents. If we know of a particular complaint by the customer against a lender or any one of their service vendors, like the appraisal company, the settlement agent needs to formally let the lender know. If a complaint is filed with the CFPB and the lender did not know, they can come back to the settlement agent and demand that the responsibility for this complaint be shared. You're thinking, how can they do that? Yes, they can. If they put that requirement on their lender's instructions to escrow and requires the settlement agent to sign this form in order for the loan to fund, then the settlement agent becomes obligated. I am here today to let you know that the real estate transaction will be changed. Consumers and the real estate industry professionals must be made aware of the changes that are coming. We need the real estate industry's help. You are the flashpoint from where everything starts on the transaction. With the new timelines, purchase contracts that involve properties with a new institutional loan will need a longer period of time to complete. A 30-day transaction may not be feasible. The default contingency time periods on the new California purchase agreements, the 17-day appraisal and the 21-day loan contingencies may also not be feasible. Buyers and sellers need to be educated as the strict timelines and consumer expectations need to be managed. If your clients know that it will be a different world starting August 1, they will be aware and your life will be easier. Remind your clients that they need to decide on a loan program right at the beginning and not change anything. Once the fees are given to the lenders at the beginning of escrow, any changes may have significant delays to closing. Any credits should be negotiated and decided before the lender sends out the CD, which is seven business days before the loan documents are drawn and signed. That means a walkthrough should not wait until after the loan docs are signed and right before closing. Communicate with your settlement agent escrow officer. Sometimes we have to emphasize that the escrow holder is in the center of the whole transaction. All the information has to come to the escrow, disseminated, and then dispersed out to the necessary third parties. Were credits negotiated? Did other terms change? Is your client going out of town? Don't let us be the last to know. There has to be a two-way flow of information between all parties. We don't know how everything will work out. There are many unresolved and unanswerable questions at this time. We will be working through the issues well into the next year. For instance, at this time, 
We don't know which other lenders will do their own CD delivery and which ones will force the settlement agent to provide them instead of taking the responsibility on themselves. A sale contract that is entered into after August 1 will not close until after September 1 at the earliest, so we really have no idea how this whole change will work out until then. But we do know this. Communication and collaboration between all parties, buyer, seller, real estate broker, lender, title, and settlement agents will be of utmost importance. Education for all industries must start now in the months prior to August 1. Those of you who are listening to this presentation, you now know what we will be facing. If your escrow officer belongs to the California Escrow Association and go to our meetings, he or she should also know. Those of you who are loan officers at the big lenders have already probably gotten the memo. But what about the other people who don't come to the meetings, those who don't keep up with the news or have their heads buried in the sand? What will happen to them when August 1 rolls around? One company did a poll, and out of 1,743 settlement agents that they polled at the end of February, 92% of them responded that they were familiar with the new rules. Only 36 were familiar with the new CD form, which is available with instructions on the CFPB site. 61% said that they are taking steps to prepare for August 1, and 39% said that they have not done anything yet. Interestingly, only 33% had been contacted by their lenders to review the new form and the new process that they would be instituting. When polled about how they think the new rules will impact their business, some of the comments include, the new form is not necessary, it will create confusion for borrower, it will increase the fees and costs for consumer, it will delay closings, and it seems designed to put small shops out of business. Only a minority thought that the new form was a positive thing for the consumers, the industry, and their practice. Just for your information, I thought I would show you the closing disclosure. This is what your buyer and your seller will be getting after the red letter date. There are five pages to the closing disclosure, and very generally, the first page shows all the loan terms, the projected payments on the new loan, and estimates on taxes and insurance. The second page shows the separate sections of all loan costs and all other costs, alphabetized under each section, and each item will have their own specially designated name. By the way, decisions have to be made on naming an item. For instance, termite work, pest control work, or structural pest control work. All the item names have to be consistent and the same from the LE through the various updated versions of the CD to the final. The third page has the calculation of funds to bring in and the summary of buyer and seller's side of the transactions. On the fourth page, you see the disclosures regarding the loan, whether it can be assumed, whether it has prepayment penalties, or whether it has impound accounts. And on the fifth page, you will find the information that used to be previously disclosed on the truth in lending disclosures. What is the total payment you make over the life of your loan, the APR, and finally, all our contact information, the lender, the mortgage broker, the real estate brokers, and escrow. Thank you all for sitting through this long but important presentation. I am Juliana Tu, and I represent the California Escrow Association, the American Escrow Association, and the Escrow Institute of California. My phone number and email address are at the very bottom. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. I will do my best to answer these questions, given the limitations of what we all know now.